A very good afternoon, Ambassador Gopinath Pillay, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sylvia and I have the pleasure of being your MC today. Welcome to the third ISAS lecture titled India in a Globalizing World, which will be delivered by Dr. Dubudi Subarao, Distinguished Visiting Research Fellow, Institute of South Asian Studies, NUS, and former governor of the Reserve Bank of India. To start the proceeding, it is now my pleasure to invite Ambassador Gopinath Pillay, Chairman, Institute of South Asian Studies, NUS, and Ambassador at Large, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Singapore, to deliver the opening remarks. Ambassador, please. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third of the series of ISPAS lectures. The first one was delivered by Shivashankar Menon, second one by Vinod Rai, and now we have the third one. Uh, ISPAS has been singularly fortunate to gather within its, its team people who have served long years and reach distinguished positions in their respective countries. They bring to the team the depth in analysis. It is not just boasting rights that ISAS gets. ISAS gets much more, and that is to be able to, to, to get expert opinion on many of the things that we write. And that makes the difference. There's a temptation. I have a speech here. It's uh, maybe not worthwhile, but uh, the temptation is for the person who's starting the opening remarks, try to prescribe to the speaker what should be said and try to curate his speech. I will try and resist that temptation. I believe in the, you know, there's a saying that when you are about to sit down for lunch with, uh, with Mao Zedong, you don't look at the waiter. In other words, if you have a good, good speaker, don't worry about who did the opening remarks. So I take that as the, as the starting point, and therefore, a long speech is unnecessary. The Dr. Subara will offer us key insights and India's economic strategy and perhaps suggest of ways of managing the very many challenges. As you know, Dr. Subarao had served as Governor of the National Bank of India, Finance Secretary to the Government of India, and Secretary to the Prime Minister's Economics Advisory Council. He, he has between the widely regarded as a leading exponent of central banking issues. From an emerging market, Perspective. Uh, Governor Tubarao is he is one of those who tackled the financial crisis, and he's one of those who survived the financial crisis. So, without any further ado, let me call him. Uh, Tong, as you say, must have the dinner. So. The race I can sit up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Pillay. It is now my honor to invite our guest speaker, Dr. Subarao, to deliver his lecture. Dr. Subarao, please.
Good afternoon. India's globalization story starts in 1991. Not in the watershed year, when India made a decisive break with the past. The past was a religious regime, a regime of heavy protection, extensive controls, and stringent regulation. It was possibly the most close large economy in the world. The government decided what firms should produce, how they must produce, how much they must produce, where they must produce. The government decided what firms should sell, where they should sell, how much they should sell, and at what price they should sell. That was a very strange combination of political democracy and economic repression. From that There is this regime. India made a sharp break in 1991. Opened up, liberalized, deregulated through broad, sweeping, and swift reforms. The industrial licensing regime was dismantled. The public sector, which was considered to be the commanding heights of the economy, they were scaled down. Import controls were lifted. Import tariffs were reduced. The government embarked on fiscal consolidation. The exchange rate went through a two-step devaluation and then was put on a market determined basis. India opened up to foreign investment. There were financial sector reforms to give India deep, vibrant, and liquid financial markets. The banking sector was opened up. For the first time, private sector was allowed into banking. So in scale and sweep, what India did in 1991 in the few years thereafter is as momentous, as dramatic, as the opening up of China under Tang in the 80s, as the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1995. Even today, nearly 30 years after 1991, people say India is an accidental globalizer. That story runs as follows, which is that there was the first Gulf War, oil prices shot up, India got into an external payments crisis, they needed IMF assistance. The only way they could get IMF assistance was through reforms, therefore India reformed. That makes an interesting copy, but it's completely misinformed. The Gulf War was just the proximate cause for India's reforms. The deeper, most substantive motivation for undertaking such deep, broad structural reforms is the realization in India that the economic philosophy that guided the country since independence, self-sufficiency, heavy protection, public sector dominance, that had run its course. If India had to attack its poverty, if India had to get out of its Hindu rate of growth, India had to embrace the world, embrace globalization. Where did this motivation come from? This motivation came from looking around the world. Here, India looked at East Asia, East Asian America, the tiger economies, globalized, liberalized, and achieved spectacular success. China. By 1991, China was already one decade into opening up. There were already clear, evident signals, early signals of China's success. When India looked at East Asia, we were dismissed because we said a large continental economy like India cannot replicate small economies like the Tigers. But when China started demonstrating the results of globalization, India was pursuing it that there is no option but to embrace globalization. With that introduction, I'm going to make 10 points about India's globalization story. The first point is that globalization comes with costs and benefits. That's the experience not just of India, that's the experience of every emerging economy. Look at the Latin American countries. 
They were the first to globalize. They were the first to liberalize. They were the first to come out of the low income trap. They were the first to come out of the dependency syndrome. Positive side of globalization. But the Latin American countries binged, they went on the consumption being used in foreign capital. They called it the crisis. <coughs> Seven episodes of the tequila crisis between the 1970s and the 1980s. Look at East Asia. First the tiger economies, then the cups. Spectacular success of the East Asian America. But again, the East Asian countries, a lot of foreign capital to get into their asset markets with the result that there was the Asian crisis. Look at devastating toll on growth, growth and welfare across East Asia. <coughs> Again, a telling reminder of both the positive and the negative sides of globalization. Take China. What China achieved by way of double-digit growth on a trot, year on year, for three decades. What China achieved by way of lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty is truly unprecedented in human history. Mm -hmm. It's also a striking demonstration of the positive side of globalization. But today, over the last decade, especially over the last five years, we've seen China trying to cope with the negative side of globalization, the debt build-up, the erosion of foreign exchange reserves, the challenge of rebalancing from investment to consumption, the challenge of rebalancing from the external sector to the domestic sector. Take my own country, India. In the years before the global financial crisis, I'm talking about the period 2003 to 2008, remember there was a great moderation all around the world? India achieved dazzling success. In the five-year period 2003 to 2008, the average growth rate of India was 9 plus percent. There was rapid growth, low and steady inflation, capital coming in, which was a sign of success. We thought we'd discover the Holy Grail. India was close to being christened the next medical economy. That was due to a number of factors. The improved productivity, rising savings rate, more efficient financial intermediation. But at the root of all those factors that contributed to the India growth story of that period, was deepening globalization. That was the positive side of India's globalization. The glory didn't last very long. The global financial crisis came, hit every country, virtually every country in the world was affected by the global financial crisis, the collapse of the Lehman Brothers in September 2008. India too was affected. But in India, there was dismay disbelief, denial that we could be affected by the crisis. People's health in India be affected by the crisis. The global financial crisis is a crisis in the financial sector. It should hit countries which allow excesses in the financial sector. But Indian financial sector is safe and sound. Our banks had no toxic assets. Our banks had no off-balance sheet activities. Why should we be affected? People said, yes, there is a recession. Recession hits countries which are dependent on exports. Like Germany, like Japan, like China. Why should a recession, a global recession, affect a country like India? After all, our exports are only 15% of GDP. People said India escaped the Asian crisis. We were not affected. Why should we be affected by the global financial crisis? The reason India was not affected by the Asian crisis, but was affected by the global financial crisis, is because in the 10-year period, between 1998, Asian crisis, and 2008, global financial crisis, in the 10-year period, India had integrated into the world, globalized, much more than we tended to acknowledge. What is the measure of globalization? The measure of globalization is the ratio of two-way trade to GDP. That ratio for India went up from 20% in 1998, 
education crisis to 40% in 2008, the year of the global crisis. A more complete measure of globalization is the two-way trade and finance flows as a proportion of GDP. That ratio for India went up from 43% in 1998, the year of the Asian crisis, to 112% in 2008. So while trade integration doubled, India's financial integration more than doubled. So India too has seen the positive and negative sides of globalization. When I was governor in 2010, remember the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis? It started in Greece. One of my staff members called me up at about 10 p.m. 10 p.m. in Mumbai with about I think 4 or 5 p.m. in Athens, of Europe. And he said, sir, there's some trouble brewing in Greece. I said, well, you know, I was quite dismissive of that. Trouble brewing in Greece? How can it affect us? We have no banking relation with Greece. We have not much trade relation with Greece. At the most, maybe a few thousand rich Indians travel to Greece for tourism. How can anything hap that is happening in Greece affect us? By the next morning, by the time the markets opened at 9 o'clock the next morning, I was proved completely wrong. What happened in Greece the previous evening affected markets around the world the next day. That's the power of globalization. So my first point is that globalization comes with costs and benefits. My second point is that the challenge for India, as it is indeed for every country, is to maximize the benefits and minimize the cost of globalization. What are the benefits of globalization? They're pretty straightforward. The textbook came that globalization unleashes competitive forces, allows an economy to operate to its comparative advantage, your exports go up, your output expands, the economy becomes a more attractive destination for foreign investment, foreign investment starts rolling in, that contributes to expanding production base, expanding output, expanding employment. So the symbiotic combination <coughs> of trade and financial integration puts the economy in a virtuous cycle. That's the trade. And as, as we've just seen, the trade is worked pretty much in practice. But what are the costs of globalization? The costs of global, first take trade integration. We know that when you're integrated into the world, you become vulnerable to forces around the world, forces beyond your control. Competition from outside can destroy entire industries. Jobs can be lost. Regional economies can be ruined. If a new product is innovated, you can lose your export markets. If there's protectionism, you can lose your export market. If there's dumping, you lose. One of the big problems in India over the last three years, not the last three years, but let's say from 2012 to 2015, were the large imports of steel from China. And that actually was one of the causes for this NPA crisis we had. So when you integrate into the world, you become vulnerable to global forces. That's trade integration, but what about financial integration? While the volatility associated with trade integration can be quite um, fearsome, take a formidable toll, volatility arising from financial integration can be very, very unforgiving. Financial integration means capital comes in, capital goes out. But the problem with capital is that it comes in when you don't want it, it goes out when you want it. So that's what they say, capital is subject to sharp surges, sudden stops, and abrupt reversals. We had that experience in India. I talked about the period before the crisis. When we had capital flows coming in, putting upward pressure, the rupee started appreciating. Out of line with fundamentals, there was an asset bubble likely to build up. So the Reserve Bank had to intervene to prevent the appreciation of the rupee. Then came the global financial crisis in 2008. Capital fled emerging markets. Actually, there was an irony in the global financial crisis in many respects, but one of them I'll tell you, which is that 
When Lehman Brothers collapsed, America was the epicenter of the crisis. Right? The dollar was the center of the crisis. The dollar should have collapsed. Exactly the opposite happened. When Lehman Brothers collapsed, the dollar started gaining strength. That's for many reasons. I cannot get into that. But the point is that capital fled the money markets. This time around, the Reserve Bank had to intervene to defend <coughs> depreciation of the exchange rate. Then we had table tantrums in 2013 when Chairman Bernanke announced that the Federal Reserve was thinking of tapering the quantitative easing. I am still surprised even today why the markets were surprised by Bernanke's statement. Because what Bernanke said at that time is as banal as saying that I'm going to sleep after having my dinner. Such an ordinary statement. Everyone in the world knew that when America embarked on quantitative easing, at some point in the time they were going to take it. But the markets decided to be surprised. Emerging economies, including India, got into crisis. And the Reserve Bank had to enter the market to prevent depreciation of the currency. So the lesson of experience is that both trade integration and financial integration can impair your macroeconomic stability, can impair your price stability, can impair your financial stability. <coughs> the challenge for countries is to manage globalization, to minimize the costs and maximize the results, uh, benefits. So how do you do that? It's easy to say, but the task is into it. So first, how do you maximize the benefit-cost ratio of trade globalization? What do you want in trade globalization? You want to increase your exports, minimize your imports, so that you have better trade balance, so that you have better terms of trade. People think of the exchange rate. The one way of increasing your exports is to maintain a weak exchange rate. The acquisition, criticism that countries manipulate their exchange rate for unfair trade advantages as old as the Bretton Woods system. Remember Japan was accused of tampering with exchange rate in the 1980s? <coughs> China was accused of tampering with exchange rate in the 1990s and 2000s. America was accused of tampering, debasing the exchange rate as part of the quantitative easing. But the reality <coughs> is that Exchange rate cannot get you a sustainable advantage in exports. It can at best get you a temporary advantage. What's the evidence for that? The evidence for that is take India-China trade, the period 2001 to 2016. The two-way trade between India and China in 2001 was $3 billion. That had ballooned by 2016 to $70 billion. 3 billion to 70 billion dollars multiplied by more than 20 times. The trade deficit, India-China trade deficit, was under 1 billion dollars in 2001. That had ballooned to over 50 billion dollars by 2016, more than 50 times. So you would think, given that China is prone to mercantilist policies of manipulating the exchange rate, that at least part of this disadvantage suffered by India because China was manipulating the exchange rate. Very sharp thought. Here's what it is. The trade balance is multiplied, but the rupee was consistently depreciating against the yuan. Which shows that India's unfavorable or declining trade deficit with China was not because of the exchange rate. It was because of China's higher productivity compared to India. So you cannot get a trade advantage by manipulating the exchange rate. The other thing that people talk about is protectionism, tariffs. We know, we hear about it almost every day now, with Trump there and that. Uh, Our own finance minister in India scrapped custody status uh, in the recent budget. 
Was that a wise thing to do? In my view, that was very good. I think the finance minister once told until the The finance minister in one stroke undid the hard work, undid the discipline that India built up over the last 20 years. <coughs> in every budget since the last 20 years, average tariffs have been brought down. Average tariff in India in 1991 was about 81%. By 2017, that was brought down to 13%, a very sharp but gradual increase. In one stroke, the finance minister did that and uh, cost India a great amount of credit. It was all the more jarring because just a week before the budget, <coughs> our Prime Minister was speaking in Davos and he decried protectionism in the rich world. Back home, the finance minister does exactly what the Prime Minister accused other countries of doing. Will this protectionist tariffs promote make in India? <coughs> no. On the contrary, by making imports costlier, they will hurt Indian industry. Will the protectionist tariffs promote exports? No. On the contrary, it will make India a less attractive destination for export costs. Will the protective tariffs promote employment? No. On the contrary, <coughs> They will erode employment Will the protectionist tariffs help consumers? No. By raising prices, they will in fact hurt consumers. So the lesson we learn from this is that the, <coughs> that the way to maximize the benefit-cost ratio of trade globalization is not to manipulation of state rate or not to manipulation of your protectionist tariffs, but by improving your productivity. That is a complex challenge. Which is my fourth point, which is that it maximizes. The benefit-cost ratio of trade globalization is a complex challenge. Maximizing the benefit-cost ratio of financial globalization is an even more complex challenge. What is financial globalization? As I said earlier, financial globalization is capital coming in and out. India needs foreign capital. Why? Because we run a current account deficit. We need foreign capital to finance the current account deficit. Foreign capital coming in is a way of getting foreign savings <coughs> to augment our domestic savings. So all about the economies, including India, need foreign savings, need capital investment. Foreign capital comes as equity or debt. Within equity, it comes a direct investment or portfolio investment. Within debt, it comes as long-term debt or short-term debt. Mm. Like every emerging economy, India too prefers equity to debt. Within equity, it prefers direct investment to portfolio investment. Within debt, it prefers long-term debt to short-term debt. But that never happens. In fact, uh, I have a law, which is that uh, you never get capital flows in the exact amount or in the exact form or at the exact time you want. That all this coming in the wrong form at the wrong time, the wrong point. <coughs> so, what do you do? You need to manage capital flows. The way to manage capital flows is capital controls are intervention in the foreign exchange markets. If I, what I'm saying sounds complex, believe me it is. Capital controls, you can slap them, they cost you credibility, they obviously keep some businessmen here that, that the capital controls can be circumvented by over invoicing import, under invoicing exports similarly forex intervention. When the central bank intervenes in the foreign exchange market, it better be credible because a central bank cannot afford to lose credibility. But when you're intervening in the foreign exchange market to manage 
the volatility in the exchange rate, you're always worried about whether you have enough reserves. More importantly, not only whether you have enough reserves, but whether the market believes that you have enough reserves. So these are all very, very difficult questions in managing the benefit-cost ratio of financial globalization. My fifth point is that uh, global cooperation is very important <coughs> to managing globalization. For trade globalization, we know we have global forums. There was GATT earlier, the WTO today. They're not perfect, but they're adequate. The WTO is the most democratic international institution. But financial globalization is an altogether different body because there is no global government. The IMF is supposed to be that. But over the years, <coughs> the consensus is that the IMF has fallen short of its basic mandate of supervising and governing the international monetary system. Today, the IMF has become a combination of a crisis manager, a policy analyst, and global monitor. With the result that there's currency wars in the IMF, in the G20, in the Basel country, there was always advanced economies and emerging economies. And they were fighting what came to be called the currency wars. You remember the phrase currency wars? The position of emerging economies used to be this in the currency wars. Saying that yes, there's a great financial problem. You unleashed all this quantitative easing, America, Europe, they were printing money, Japan. The expectation was that that money would be absorbed within their countries, but Firms, households in those countries were not poor. <coughs> With the result that all that quantitative easing money came into the global system, came into emerging economies, and created problems for them. So emerging economies said you must be sensitive to the spillover impact of your policies. After all, when we were not open, when we did not globalize, you criticized that we did not globalize, we, we did not open up, but now we opened up. So, just as all of us are enjoying benefits, we must also pay the costs. The burden of adjustment cannot be left to emerging economies alone. That was the argument of the emerging economies. Advanced economies, on their hand, turn, they would, they would not deny that there is a spillover. They would admit that there is a spillover. But they say that the spillover is an inevitable byproduct of managing their economy that America, Europe, UK, Japan, their revival is an international public good. That emerging economies should put up with whatever cost they have to pay because if America, Europe, Japan revive, it will help them also. Right. This is in short saying that the dollar is our currency but your problem. This is what the Chairman Bernanke said in uh, G20 meeting in Yungjiao in Korea in 2010, saying that uh, I argue that America's revival is good for the world. <coughs> so the point is that global cooperation is very, very essential for emerging economies to manage globalization. My sixth point is that in this, uh, the irony of the globalization story is that tables have turned. Those of you who are old enough to remember that in the 1960s, in the 1970s, in the 1980s, in the 1990s, it was emerging economies who were agitating against globalization. The charge against these countries used to be that your multinational corporations are coming into our countries, they're plundering our resources, damaging our environment, exploiting our labor, siphoning away capital, avoiding taxes, destroying our local industry. Remember the story? Now tables have turned. Now it's America, 
economic Europe, which agitate against globalization, protectionist policies of President Trump, but it's not just Trump. Even Bernanke, when he was chairman, said that the global financial crisis <coughs> is a consequence of Chinese saving too much. The Chinese are not consuming enough. There is savings club. All that money is flowing back from China into America. So it is rich countries with, who are agitated, who are anxious, who are uh, turning against globalization. Remember they used to tell us in the 70s, 80s, 90s that your problems are caused by your policies. We are not responsible. Now tables have turned. Now it's emerging economies who tell rich countries in global forums that your, problem, your, your problems are caused by your policies. So the story of globalization has turned around completely. I will uh, pass over this point except to say that if you ask me before the crisis, will the rupee ever become convertible on the capital account fully? I would probably I could have said yes, indeed I did say yes. But today, if you ask would the rupee become convertible on the capital account, probably not. The rupee would travel towards capital convertibility, would move forward, indeed has moved forward. There was masala bonds in the last five years, foreigners enjoy almost total convertibility, NRIs enjoy convertibility. Resident Indians don't enjoy full convertibility. I think we're going to reform, open up more. But I don't think we will reach the complete capital convertibility ever, not at least in the foreseeable future. My eighth point is this. Again, I'll be very brief on this, which is that India needs to generate jobs. Therefore, it wants to generate a manufacturing revolution, make in India. There is a hope, there is an expectation that India can replicate the China experience. China opened up in 1980s, so perhaps India can become an export powerhouse like China. Well, India's aspiration is understandable. It's unlikely that India will be able to replicate the China experience because the world in 2018 is a lot different than the world in the 1980s in China. World demand is going to be subdued. There's going to be secular stagnation. Artificial intelligence and robotics are changing the comparative um, advantage of countries. Rich countries are getting older. As people get older, they consume more services than goods. And services are less exportable. For all these reasons, India will not be able to replicate the China experience. My ninth point, which is this, which is quite self-evident, that globalization is a double-edged sword. It comes with costs and benefits. Immense opportunities, but ruthless challenges. The temptation for emerging economies is to withdraw from globalization. I think that would be a completely wrong response, like throwing away the baby with the bathwater. Yes, managing globalization is a long haul effort. You cannot put it on an autopilot. You have to be calibrating every day. But emerging economies have a lot to gain by pursuing globalization and promoting globalization. Those of you who have been following me so far, that's a listing of the points that I've made, my points I've made, which brings me to my tenth point and final point, which is what should be India's agenda to manage the globalization? This is not in any particular order, but I believe that India should keep track of all this, eight perhaps more. Three deficits. The three deficits are the fiscal deficit and the current economy. 
whenever there's a balance of payments problem, we think that it is because of the current context, it's because of oil price has gone up, or because there was war in Syria. <coughs> no. Every time India had a balance of payments crisis in 1991 or the New York crisis in 2013, was the result of domestic pressures, was the result of accumulated fiscal profit discipline. It is fiscal deficit that spills over into capital contracts. That is why the finance minister's decision in the recent budget to loosen up on fiscal consolidation is a worry. Because not only is it a regression on fiscal consolidation, but it comes at a time when oil prices gone down. So India can, should always be aware of green uh, deficits. Keep financial stability all this on the radar screen. That's quite understandable. I spoke to you about the Lehman crisis, about the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis. More recently, <coughs> closer home, East Asia, China. Exchange rate back in August 2015, remember August 14, 2015? Sent shock waves around the world. So in a globalizing world, anything anywhere affects people everywhere. As they say, the flattering of a butterfly and raising can affect global markets everywhere. The third thing is manage the impossible trinity. This is a bit technical, I will not go into it. Improve the ease of doing business. Very intuitive. You want to globalize because you want foreign investment. But one way of getting foreign investment is to improve ways of doing business. India has done reasonably well, broke into the top hundred for the first time. But the agenda ahead is quite formidable. Reduce inequality. <coughs> Not very obvious, but very important. One of the inherent characteristics of globalization, whether in rich countries or poor countries, is that it accentuates inequalities. Because rewards to capital are typically higher than rewards to labor. But inequalities threaten social order. Globalization lifts all boats, but doesn't lift all boats to the same level and with a problem there. So as much as you want to exploit the advantage of globalization, you need to be focusing on the downsides of globalization and taking corrective action. Even in India, especially in India, inequalities can be quite uh, lethal in their impact on the society. Improve capacity to negotiate a global forum. Let me spend two minutes on this. In the international forums after the global financial crisis, I told you tables turned. So advanced economies were more vulnerable on a weaker wicket. Emerging economies were a little more spiked. So the, the refrain of emerging economies used to be that, look, you cost it. You know, all along over the last 30, 40 years, we blamed us whenever there was a crisis in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, India, wherever. But here there was a crisis because you mismanaged your financial sector. And all the rules of the financial sector were framed by bodies over which you had complete control. The IMF, the Basel Committee. So you were a place. So, emerging economies, for it chair at the table in G20, in the IMFC, in the Basel Committee, in the Financial Stability Board. One thing I realized, I participated in some of those meetings, was getting a chair at the table is necessary but not sufficient. You should be able to argue your position. And I found that we were particularly happy. Take Basel III. Again, I don't want to get into technicalities. Basel III is improving banking capital, the quality and quantum of banking capital, as a post crisis remedial <coughs> measure. We were not, emerging economies were not able to project their point of view in the formulation of Basel III, with the result that the costs of Basel III are disproportionately going to be on banking sector in emerging economies, possibly even in Singapore. So it's just not enough 
can chair the table, you should be able to argue your position. You should need to own your skills, improve your capability. The final thing is focus on the fourth channel of globalization. How do we understand globalization? We understand globalization through three channels. Movement of people, movement of goods and services, and movement of capital. But over the last 20 years, we know in front of our eyes, a new channel of globalization to open up the movement of ideas to internet. We've seen around the world millions of entrepreneurs who have broken the limitations of their <coughs> markets by leveraging on this new channel of globalization. In Singapore, because there are some Singaporeans here, I think, they're very diffident, you know, they say they're a small country, but a dead dot, a red dot in the ocean, they get lost. We're a very successful country, but we are really unable to influence the rest of the world. This is an opportunity for Singapore as well, because you're no longer tied down by geography, by your small market. Geography is no longer destined. Globalization of ideas rewards entrepreneurs, breaks down barriers of distance, barriers of location. So the challenge, the final challenge for India, is to prepare 1.3 billion people to capitalize on this new channel of globalization. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to invite Ambassador Pillay to stage again to chair the question and answer session. I will now hand the floor to Ambassador Pillay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I had indicated what you can expect, and I don't think we were disappointed. Thank you very much for a substantive, excellent presentation. So now it's up to you to make the best. Mr. Mishra has already put up his hand. I think we'll go by eight, I think. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Ranveer Chauhan. Thank you for a wonderful <coughs> presentation and of ideas. Could I uh, check with you that this pathway that you give, this vision for India in a globalizing world, uh, it is a slower pathway and for some part of the India watchers, there is an expectation that perhaps there is a faster India somewhere. Is there a possibility? <coughs> Um, the presentation highlights the care of globalization. It also highlights that perhaps India will not be able to have the levers that China had. Is there a promise for India to be faster and bigger? Because it has known, at one time it was known as the Hindu growth rate. So, the talk does not seem to present opportunities for India to be breaking through at a faster speed. I just want to check, is that right in my well, understanding? Of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah, India is certainly a country of the future, enormous promise. There's so many low-hanging fruit. Uh, you know, 6.5 percent, even the finance minister said last week that India should, at the minimum, clock 8 percent growth. And we have the drivers of growth, most of all, we have a large consumer base. You know, in an economy with a per capita income of eighteen hundred dollars, any increase in income <coughs> simply translate to consumption and therefore to stimulate the economy. So even if the world situation is not exactly supportive of 
leveraging on globalization as much as China did. I believe India has enormous opportunities, if only because there is so much of that potential. Maybe 20 years from now, when India's clock double digit growth year on year, then we can say, yes, we have exploited all the low hanging fruit, where do we go now? But for the next 20 years, I think India is certainly a country of the future. And if we do the right things in the right time, and in spite of credibility and trust of the domestic and foreign investors, India has a great future. Yes, Mishra. Representable Mr. Mishra. Okay, um, yes. Thank you very much for the excellent, excellent presentation. I think your presentation was uh, very insightful and of very high high quality. Okay, the thing is that you started your presentation with uh, the year 1991, and I believe what happened in 1991 when uh, Manmohan Singh was finance minister in Nishima in Nishima Rao's uh, cabinet. I think that's like uh, like a second independence from for, for India. And the thing is that um, I'll let your your view on on what on the on or what happened pre-1991, because pre-1991, pre, 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 pre there was a, uh, India was, well, there was a transition from the British Raj to the licensed Raj, and under the licensed Raj, companies had restrictions how much to export to another country. Today, we are talking about exporting to another countries, but at that time, there was a restriction on how much we can uh, export. In fact, the company Reliance, the highest, the one of the biggest company in India, their success is because they broke Indian laws. And it's similar to how Gandhiji made, made so. And the, the, the other point you have made is that uh, I was very pleased that you, you, you spoke about how India cannot walk on the path of, uh, of uh, protectionism, protectionism. And given how the Western countries are reacting, I think it's very welcoming that if someone, someone like you spoke uh, against uh, protectionism for the case of India. But at the same time, you say that you know India cannot follow China export and growth, and something very unique is happening in India these days under the Modi government is that we see on one hand we have a, a hyper nationalist who actually goes around the world and to canvas for foreign direct investment. This is unthought of during the uh, the time of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru during the early days. It's unthought of a nationalist asking for foreign direct investment. It's, yes, and, and you spoke about the, the US quantitative easing. When the US was having uh, quantitative easing at that time, India actually benefited from, for, uh, India actually benefited together to get Brazil and China because when the US uh, treasury bonds interest rate was very low, a lot of investment came to India. And when the interest rate was going up, this, uh, the investments have been going up. So, what's your, your view on that? Whether it's on the harmful effect of FDI. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for the extended comment. <laughs> People say that India got political independence in 47, got economic independence only in 1991. And a lot of people believe that it's not completely economic independence even now. Your specific question about uh, the impact of quantitative easing, I think all emerging economies suffered the adverse impact of quantitative easing in America, in Europe, in Japan, and in the UK. Two different extents, of course. And this is not FDI that you were talking about. The money that was unleashed as a result of quantitative easing was money in search of quick yield. FDI is typically not in search of quick yield. You ask our ambassador, the chairman, Ambassador Gopinath Pillay. FDI goes for a longer term commitment. That's why, as I said, India, China, South Africa, Turkey, Brazil, Mexico, all the emerging economies want FBI in preference to portfolio. <coughs> the money that came in as a consequence of quantitative easing was portfolio flows in certain quick yields. So it came in, created problems for us, pushed up our exchange rates. Uh, created bubbles in our asset markets, and as soon as America started raising interest rates, it reversed the market. That exactly is the problem of spillover and the need for global cooperation. 
uh, my colleague from South South Korea. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Sparrow, for a great lecture. Uh, I have a question about India's uh, growth model. And uh, as far as I understand the Make in India initiative, the primary aims of the initiative are to not only to create domestic employment in India, but also to export of products which are made in India. So um, I was wondering about your argument about why India cannot replicate Chinese model or so-called East Asia's developmental state model, which were encouraged by export export oriented industrialization. That's my first question. And my second question is about your I mean, whether you have any idea of, whether you have any ideal growth model for India, um, which you think and for a longer time. In the economy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sergeant, for this question. The first question about why I believe India cannot replicate the China model of export led growth is three reasons. First, when China opened up in the 1980s, world trade was growing at a scorching pace, world demand was growing at a scorching pace. Today, World trade is growing, but not growing as fast. While demand is not growing, we're talking about secular stagnation in rich countries, etc. So India cannot expect vibrant demand in the rich countries. The second reason is that when China opened up in the 1980s, this offshoring was becoming a popular model of production. You saw that in East Asia, hey, you've seen it in your own country, in Korea. Offshoring as a production model is declining in popularity and in its economic logic for a number of reasons. The third reason India cannot replicate the China model is sheer demographics. Japan population is already declining. Europe population is stabilizing. America population growth rate is coming down. So as people get older, consumption patterns change. People consume more services than goods. They go on holidays. They need more hospital care. They more need more health care. One of the fastest growing industries in Japan today is adult diapers. Right? So there is a changing pattern in consumption and that will go against India's interest. Okay. The second question on uh, growth model for India, I don't know if you can discuss hardcore economics, but India's growth model has to be firing on all engines. Consumption, investment, exports, and uh, government investment, but not government. <laughs> My friend from SBI Council. Thank you for a great lecture. I mean, I always uh, appreciate when you speak because you make it very lucid and very simple for people. So my question is that, um, see, China is a very major player in the world market. And uh, I think uh, China has gained a lot from this uh, globalization. And China is a major factor in almost all the countries because all the countries always accuse China of dumping goods at low prices. You said that the difference in price between uh, of goods and services between two countries is because of the competitive advantage. So, you, but there is an allegation that uh, China manipulates its exchange rate, as you said. China also gives certain uh, subsidies. China also keeps wages artificially low, so as to reduce the cost of the production of their goods. Like for instance, steel in India recently, all the steel companies in India got into a lot of problems because of dumping of steel by China, and anti-dumping duties were imposed by the government of India. So how do you, I mean, how do you see this uh, Chinese issue in the sense that, uh, I mean, in the sense, how do we tackle it? Because this is a problem which most of the countries in the world face. I mean, the, that under the guise of uh, globalization. China is able to dump goods 
in most of the countries and there will be food trade surplus in most of the countries. I'm sitting at this forum, I cannot be a spokesperson for China. <laughs> uh, China, of course, is certainly guilty of uh, some mercantilist policies, manipulating the exchange rate, dumping subsidies to get their labor, <coughs> while the whole world, including India, can agitate and can bring China to conform to global norms. My bigger point is that the disadvantage or the heavy shift in the trade deficit, the growing trade deficit, we will be misdiagnosing the problem if we attribute that to China's mercantilist policies. The truth is that China has a tremendous advantage over India in terms of productivity. And we should be able to improve our productivity in India. We should, of course, in global forums, in WTO, in D20, wherever, agitate against China, or any country, not just China, but any country that is not being a good global citizen. We should be agitating against that. But that should not detract us from a more fundamental responsibility, obligation, priority of improving our productivity. Thank you for the enviable clarity of your 10 points. I would like to engage you on your point 1 and point 10. The first point talks about the costs and benefits. I would uh, tackle it by going back to the theories of economic growth of W.W. W. Rusko. And when an economy is taking off, what it needs to do is to generate an autonomy of politics so that it can become self-sustaining. Where, one would have to argue, that uh, a self-sustaining economy would concentrate on the owners of capital, on the haves, and the have-nots would pay the costs, which is not possible in a democracy. So the classic problem in India becomes a tussle between uh, electoral logic and logic of the capital, from which comes the adage from people like uh, Stephen Cole that India is one of those countries which is constantly emerging but never quite arriving. It may be labor market reforms, it may be land acquisition, the have-nots will tone it down. So I'd like your comment, because when you say that one should think about cost and benefits, there is a somewhat subliminal hope that people will benefit by benefiting the economy, and those who are paying the costs will stand aside. That doesn't quite happen. The second point is uh, a unique privilege for us to have you here because when you talk about the capacity to negotiate, we are talking about someone who has been part of those negotiations. Now, my generation of political scientists was brought up to believe that there is no good faith in international negotiations, that people you are negotiating against have all the cards in their hand. So, can you tell us about examples where the have-nots at the international level have actually successfully negotiated towards a level playing field. That negotiation can deliver what revolution could not. Thank you. Now, thank you for those questions to deep scholarship. First, on uh, Rostov's model, I, I'm quite rusty on Rostov's model, status of growth model, etc. But what I want to comment on is this, that a democracy is not a necessary safeguard against disproportionate uh, distribution of the benefits of growth. It's America, great democracy, right? But even in America, over the last 25 years, 25 years I'm not talking about Trump or Obama, over the last 25 years, greater returns have gone to capital and to labor. American labor has been hesitant, has been inhibited for asking for wage increases because they knew that if they asked for wage increases, the 
uh, the entrepreneurs will shift production to China or to Vietnam or to Thailand or to Mexico. With the result that a disproportionate share of the benefits of growth in America, in the rich world, have gone to capital. As it means labor. Capital has been hurt, excuse me, capital has been rewarded at the benefit of labor. Democracy could not resolve this. They elected Trump on the promise that he would probably be able to correct this. My own belief is that this is such an inexorable force that a single political leader will be unable to do this. There is today globalization. There is robotics and artificial that too irritating against the interest of labor. So these great forces which are tilting the balance in favor of capital, will continue to exert their force. And I too, political scientists such as yourself, will have to see to what extent democracy can be a check on this. On your second question about where there's been a decisive victory in the global negotiations, it's difficult to pinpoint. No, this is where we scored a victory. But I believe that over the last 10 years, global institutions, if not rich countries, certainly global institutions, have become more sensitive to the concerns of emerging economies. The IMF, the World Bank, FSB, Basel Committee, closer home, the ADB, they won't become more sensitive to the concerns of emerging economies. One example is capital convertibility that I talked about. And before the crisis, India said, no, 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 forget about capital convertibility, we're never going to do that. The world would have frowned on us, IMF would have pronounced against us, India's credibility would have been lost. One of the most remarkable intellectual shifts brought on by the crisis is that capital convertibility need not be the holy grail any further. So today we can confidently say that no, it won't, be a, it'll, it won't ever happen or it might happen very far into your grandchildren's lifetime. You get away with it. Because the world view has changed, it becomes sensitive to the concerns of the world. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I have a comment to make about this. Uh, Chinese model of export led growth and other things. Actually, it's not China alone. Even Japan started off with export led growth. And now we see Japan economy is more or less at a standstill. And the Chinese economy, after a long time, is again slowing down. And if you look at India, immediately after the globalization started in 1991, the early days the growth was attributed more towards export of services, mainly in the IT sector. Then only the growth started. And I think India doesn't need to go for export-led growth because of the huge population that it has. And most of the manufacturers are able to capture the domestic market. And it's not absolutely necessary that they have to go for export-led growth. So I think in that way, I think they're on the right track. Now, as far as the globalization, the financial sector, and trying to get more and more foreign exchange, foreign investment into the country, one of the things that is needed is the confidence in the financial sector, the banking system, etc. I know as a governor, you have <laughs> understood the situation, and now, with all these camps about, started with the Malaya, now Nero Modi and the other one reported yesterday. Is there any problem in the supervision of banks who are able to give so high a loan? And when they suddenly they realize they are given so much loan, which is unrecoverable. No, there certainly is a problem. In fact, I was wondering why that question has not come up so far. <laughs> <laughs> and although it's got nothing, not much to do with globalization. I believe that the alleged fraud in PNB 
dents the credibility of India's systems of checks and balances and therefore hurts investment prospects. There are at the moment a number of questions about the default of all the checks and balances, the management of the banks, the boards of the banks, the internal and external audits, and of course the South Bank of India to supervise them every day. Yes, the Reserve Bank is the regulator. It is certainly, it cannot wash away the blame. It's got to take some of the blame for it. The Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank sometime, I think, in October sometime, gave a speech saying that we have received complaints about the SWIFT being compromised. And I believe the Reserve Bank had issued instructions, this is what I gathered from the newspaper. I believe the Reserve Bank had issued instructions to banks to plug those reports. But then this happened under their very own eye. So now people are saying that the Reserve Bank should actually have gone and checked if their instructions are confirmed. But this is one instance, right? One scam that has come out and that now all of us with so many questions being asked. The more important thing is whether we would take corrective action based on this to see that not only a scam similar to this, but no scam comes about. Lehman Brothers collapsed, right? Uh, there was a scam in practically every large investment bank in the world over the last 10 years. I'm not saying that India's guilt or burden is any less, but the entire financial sector is prone to misbehavior to say the least. And the regulators and supervisors are constantly on the watch. It's a game of chicken. You've got to be constantly ahead. You plug some loophole, the regulator plugs the loophole, the regulator tries, tries to get ahead of it. So, uh, we've got to be more vigilant, we've got to be more intelligent, we've got to be more skillful, more talented. One of the things, one of the things, financial sector around the world realized now, the crisis, is that they have got to hold that regulation and supervising skills. Uh, thank you, uh, and, uh, Dr. Silverell, for an excellent uh, uh, expose uh, on, if not the Ten Commandments uh, of the Indian economy, certainly the Ten uh, Pillars of Wisdom. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more that it isn't enough to have a chair at the table, having spent many years at the WTO myself. Uh, the challenge is to insert your ideas into the agenda, and that's where you need all the skills that, uh, that uh, are essential. Uh, my, the reason for my intervention is actually to react to Professor Vitra's second point. Is, is there any specific example of a country which has an example where uh, some entity has profited from uh, negotiating a level playing field. Yes, it has. As you know, that uh, there are about 50 countries in the world who believe that they have certain structural impediments towards development. And these countries are part, uh, classified themselves as least developed countries. Now, there are examples of countries who have negotiated out of this position uh, who are through creating a uh, level playing field in international negotiating forums. One such example, for instance, is Botswana. Botswana. Many believe that Bangladesh has also quite done that, but is not in a position to come, come out uh, with clarity with regard to its position uh, in this uh, category because of the special differential privileges they get in terms of market access. So yes, there are examples of countries who have prof profited and benefited to creating level playing fields. No, that's an excellent comment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the young lady here. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Samara. My name is Carissa. I'm actually a reporter from the Straits Times. Um, my question is about the RCEP negotiation since you brought up um, global cooperation and protectionism. Um, there's been some reports saying that India has been a bit of, like, been a little resistant to it. So, what are India's concerns about it, and how can everyone else at the table sort of view on it? 
Can I request my colleague, Dr. Palit, to answer that question? He's an expert on our set. And uh, Amit, would you please? Uh, what, are, what are India's concerns and how can the rest of the world concerns you know, of our set? Concerns of our set. Well, I suppose uh, concerns to the extent that uh, India has issues in offering as much market access as is being demanded. And that is uh, essentially in terms of the concerns that its domestic industry has. But uh, a deeper concern could be traced to a political insecurity as well, because commitment to ASEAN implies opening up the market to China also. It's kind of a blanket commitment. So India began on a note of compromise by offering three blocks of market access to three groups of countries, uh, which was accepted eventually but not accepted completely because there's something more in terms of reciprocity that's demanded from India. And we have had these conversations at our institute, uh, various people from India have come and talked. And I suppose at this point in time, this is an issue which is also politically sensitive. And the current government would not wish to push this too far. Not to be quoted. I don't know if it's only to be attributed to Dr. Rao. I had two questions, Dr. Rao. Actually, my first question was uh, coming back to the Indian banks. And I go back to the problem which uh, began emerging at the time when you were the uh, uh, head of the Reserve Bank of India, the non performing loans. And Today, this problem is of enormous proportions, and we do understand that unlike uh, an economy like China, the Indian government does not have the financial capital, the capacity to recapitalize its banks over and over again by clearing the balance sheets. What is the solution to this? Is the solution in privatization of Indian banks that are owned by the government? Would you suggest that is the solution A? My second question is that you have uh, deliberated at length, not here, but in various other forums on the relationship between the Ministry of Finance and the Reserve Bank of India. Would you argue that the Reserve Bank of India, in order to be a more effective regulator and guardian of monetary exchange and capital policy, needs more functional autonomy, as well as decision-making autonomy? Thank you for those questions. And the first question about the non-performing assets problem, NPAs. The first thing I want to say is that the NPA problem has been in train for the last six or seven years. It's not something that adapted all of a sudden. And the longer it's been festering, the bigger it's become. The stereotype view around the world is because of uh, crony capitalism. Some capitalists that you mentioned. I would say it's part of that. You know, I, India cannot deny the existence of crony capitalism. But to attribute the entire NPA problem to crony capitalism, I think, will be misleading from a diagnostic point of view. NPAs have been a consequence of a number of factors. 2010, India embarked on this huge investment in infrastructure. Public-private partnership, PPP model, which is worthy territory, both for the banks and for the corporates. And there was excess investment. There were delays in those projects because of uh, delays in clearances, court orders. The amount of Supreme Court had issued so many orders about export, about environment, etc. So to attribute all of the NPA problem to this crony capitalism is misleading it is a consequence of a number of factors which came together. Now, over the last five years, during Governor Rajan's time and during Governor Patel's time, the South Bank had embarked on a number of instrumentalities. The government is embarked on a number of instrumentalities, including the insolvency and bankruptcy. 
Does the government have the money to recapitalize banks? No, it does not. We know it and it does not have given the fiscal obligations it has. So what's the solution? The solution they talk about is a bank holding company. In fact, two days ago the finance minister said that we're thinking of a bank holding company as a solution to the NPA problem. I don't think it's a solution. Bank holding company transferring problem from the left hand to the right hand. <coughs> well, is there is a, and they talk about other options like we will privatize but with a golden share. That we will give non voting shares to the public. I think the government in India will go through this financial engineering options one by one and within about a couple of years they will exhaust these options and come to the conclusion not only with internally but demonstrate to the whole world that there is no option but to privatize. Within two, three years it could happen, within six months it could, may not happen for six years. But I believe that there is no option but to privatize public sector banks in some way or the other. Because the government just does not have the money to capitalize money. They will prove, uh, as I said, they will try everything, including consolidation of banks, but all of them will be less than that. The second question about the autonomy of the South Bank of India, etc., you know, it's a very, very difficult question. It's not unique to India. It's a question that played out in every country. Today, uh, Chairman Jeremy Powell is, uh, has spoken before this House, so is going to speak tonight. There are issues of autonomy of the Federal Reserve. There are issues of autonomy of the Bank of Japan. There are issues of autonomy of the Bank of England. There are issues of autonomy of the ECB too. Or the ECB is not one country. So I think to single out the Reserve Bank of India and Government of India as uh, not working on this model of economy, I think this again is written. There are problems in India. And I think things are gradually improving. There's been no regressive step, all steps in maintaining the functional economy and enhancing the functional economy of the central bank having the positive direction. Last question. Yes. I how do you see that like, the global company is not really exploiting the you know Indian economy in the sense that I'll just give you an example of uh, bigger company like you know Amazon and uh, and financial, you know, who have a deep pocket <coughs> to burn their capital and try to get a you know monopolistic situation. And all these companies are really uh, investing into India, right? It may uh, hamper the local business when they are just burning the capital for getting the market share. So how you know like India government should tackle this kind of problem where the deep pocket company really are just really just exploiting the you know like local entrepreneurs? Uh, there is no simple a simple answer to your question. For the last 250 years since the first industrial revolution companies have been fighting for their advantage. On the one hand, you want to protect your domestic industry. On the other hand, you want foreign competition to come in because you don't want your domestic industry to become incompetent and uncompetitive. But if people with deep pockets come, there is predatory behavior. <coughs> Amazon can come in and eat up a number of other small firms and then expose its predatory behavior. But the silver lining in China, in India, in other emerging economies is that some of the local champions have been able to stand up to global competition. In India, this is offering competition to Amazon. <coughs> there are some local taxi companies which are offering competition to Google. So it's not as if uh, emerging economies have just given up the fight. They're fighting, and I believe they're fighting very valiantly. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry. There are still people with questions, but I'm instructed by that formidable lady there. <laughs> so I have to respect that. But perhaps I can use my chairman's position to ask one last question, which is a personal question. How much does the government of India 
consult a retired governor. <laughs> Your own personal experience. My own personal experience with you. Okay, so I think different experts, different retired people, not just governors at the central bank, have been consulted by the government. But my own experience has been that uh, I've not reached out to them in one instruction. But that's, uh, you know, if I think about India, I always say this, that there is such enormous gap. Capacity. Both the non serving people among retired people, that if one person is not consulted, it is not a bit of of expertise. Chairman, you know that uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, we used to complain about brain drain. That India's IIT graduates, you know, we spending enormous amounts of money on them, they're going away serving other countries. Today they're not shy. You say, okay, let a thousand IIT people go away, but they will come back to us and contribute to the country. And even if a thousand people go away, there are ten thousand people still in the country. So the depth of talent in India is so rich that even if they don't consult one retired central bank governor, I don't think they're in Thank you. I'm glad you. I'm glad the government of India has to occupy its time in asking for free advice because we get a chance to have a little bit of it. Thank you very much and we really appreciate the presentation and I think we have benefited from it. Thank you very much. Thank you Dr. Subarao and Ambassador Kune. With that, we have come to the end of the third ISAS lecture. The next lecture, titled South Asia, Missed Opportunities and Neglected Challenges, will be delivered by Ambassador Shang Sal, former Foreign Secretary of India, on 9 March 2018, at the Empress One Ballroom, Arkin Hotel. The lecture will be followed by the joint ISIS CPA workshop on security and governance in South Asia. We look forward to seeing you at the lecture and at the workshop, as well as at future ISIS events. We have, arri we have arranged a reception outside. And with that, from, from all of us at ISIS, thank you and have a good evening.